And so my name's Matt, I think I've met all of you, and I'm a volunteer with BARC. Um, I've been working with the organization for I think eight years now, uh, leading hikes and uh, I'm on the Forest Watch Committee as well. Um, and Meredith over here is on staff and she is going to do a short introduction as to who BARC is and what we do and why we're here today and kind of in a general sense and then I'll talk specifically about this hike and what we're going to see and what we'll hopefully take away from it. BARC is a group that's dedicated to preserving Mount Hood National Forest and um, hikes have been a really big component of BARC's history. We've been getting people out into the forest uh, once a month on these hikes for as long as BARC has been around, so over a decade, around 13 years. And we also like to get people out into the forest to help ground truth timber sales um, and really get on the ground and see what is happening in our public land out here. Uh, the Forest Service proposes many timber sales that volunteers like Matt and other folks um, actually get out into the woods and like walk the entire length and check out for different species and see what's going on. Sometimes we find inconsistencies that you know the Forest Service's plants is one thing and we find something else and we use that information it's really valuable to help us stop or reduce the size and scope of these timber sales mm -hmm. um, in areas where they find that where we find they are inappropriate but we train volunteers in how to do this field work and we would like to get more and more people involved um, and become advocates for the forest the way that we are. So if you do want to get involved um, and volunteer, you can talk to myself about that. Today we're going to go hiking on the Elk Cove Trail. It's, uh, we're up here on the north side of the mountain. So Mount Hood is right here. You probably saw it when we were driving up along 35. Uh, we went out this road here, and so we're right here at this trailhead. Um, and we're, so last summer, in I think September, uh, a, a fire ignited um, in this area, and they named it Dollar Lake, even though Dollar Lake is a tiny little lake that's much, much higher up on the mountain and wasn't actually burned uh, in the fire, but I don't know why they gave it that name. But in any case, it was about 6,500 acres. It burned very quickly. It was a very, very uh, dry conditions. It was kind of at the end of the. It was at the end of the summer, so it's actually right about now. And you know, uh, you know that at the end of the summer, things really get dried out. I don't know if you noticed when we were driving in, the Department of Forestry sign said that you know the fire danger was extreme. Um, so it's very, very dry right now out here, and so this is a prime time for. Um, wildfires to ignite and burn very quickly um, through very dry country. And so that's exactly what happened in this case. Just to give you some orientation, this darker green area is the outline of the Mount Hood Wilderness. Um, and we're going to go, there's a 12 person limit uh, for per group to go into wildernesses. And so we're actually going to stop right at the boundary here today. Um, but um, we, if we get that far. So, but anyway, so that, this little doohickey here is this on this map. Okay, and the trailhead that we're at is um, is right here. So we're going to be heading up this way and then straight into the middle of the burn. And the dark black outline is is the the mapped the burn extent that they mapped using uh, uh, aircraft overflights. Um, and then the colored areas in the middle are uh, basically a, a a metric of the severity of the burn in different areas. And so one of the things we're going to talk about today is how, you know, they talk about 6,500 6, acres being burned, which, you know, if you added up the area of this outline, that's what that would be. But in reality, it's a patchwork of really, really severely burnt areas and then areas that were barely touched at all. Um, and that's a really important component of how the forest responds after a fire and it's just integral into into fire ecology in general. So um, anyway, and so as you can see, all of this little, ha uh, these hashed areas here that are kind of in green, that's all the wilderness area. And so the burn largely occurred um, in only in the wilderness area and kind of jumped out here and there. And so one of the, the reason that that's important is because the Forest Service, whenever a fire erupts, and especially when the conditions are really hot and dry and there's a chance that it could grow, they have to make um, a series of decisions about how they're going to respond to the fire. Um, in the past, the, the knee-jerk reaction has always been to immediately suppress 
um, the fire, and so that and that management decision it has been in place since. Um, oh, there's a very popular book that came out recently by Timothy Egan called The Big Burn, and it was kind of it happened right at the beginning of the Forest Service's life, and it was this huge, like millions of acres of of uh, wilderness that burned in Idaho and in Montana, and it created this this very deeply ingrained cultural idea about what wildfire means and so the Forest Service took it upon themselves to basically just suppress every fire as quickly as possible wherever they occur and obviously that they're not able to respond in the same way to every fire and so you know throughout the last hundred years or so there have still been large wildfires in lots of areas um, but that's been kind of the the agency mantra um, that is starting to change. Um, there's a, a there's a lot of research and 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 sort of a new guard in the Forest Service that they're starting to make more um, complex management decisions, and then also making decisions that are are taking into account the safety of the fire crews that are responding. And so it's not, you know, suppress under, um, you know, absolutely under all conditions. Um, but one of the things that goes into making these decisions about whether or not to suppress is where is the fire burning? Um, and in this case, because it is burning in wilderness, the options they have to respond to the fire are different. Um, they're not allowed to bring in uh, motorized equipment. They're not allowed to, um, unless it's an absolute extreme emergency, they're not allowed to fly helicopters over or fly airplanes over. Um, and at the same time too, because it's wilderness, the management of that area is very different and they, they generally, the idea is, is that we're going to leave this forest alone and let it do what it will. Um, and the, and so part of the decision that was the reason that they let it go for as long as they did was because, because of where it was and then it also, you'll, as you'll see when we get into it, the terrain in this area is incredibly complex and steep and so it's very difficult to actually fight a fire um, on the ground. The things that I'd like to cover today are a little bit about about um, fire policy and the way that the Forest Service, for, Forest Service manages fire from a, from a just like a management standpoint. Um, Bark's sort of uh, corollary policy or like our, our idea about you know what they're doing right and what they're what they could be doing better um, and then also just talking about um, just fire ecology in general um, and then that kind of leads into talking about forest ecology in general, stream ecology, a little bit of that. And so I guess the reason I'm telling you that is that if you have any specific questions or things that you want to know more about or things that you're really curious about or confused about or heard in the media and are just bewildered, um, feel free to ask questions. that we want to put forward or advocate? That's a really good question and there's two things. Um, one is that the Forest Service actually took a lot of flack um, for the way that they responded to this fire. There was a number of the communities that are in uh, the gorge um, got really upset because they let it burn um, and the and so one of the things that we could do is is write little, I have some little postcards and we can, after our, at the end of the hike today, if you want to, um, you can write a little note just basically voicing, well, if you agree, I should say, you know, voicing your support over the way that they decided to respond to this fire and, and basically acknowledging that these decisions are difficult and there's no perfect answer. And so and I think that, that they, they don't often get friendly notes from people and so that would be something that we could that we could do um, so the other thing is is that thank you for reminding me just really quickly before we go um, this is almost the same map as the fire one there's the little doohickey for the wilderness this is a brand new um, uh, uh, logging project that the Forest Service has proposed um, in this area um, this map is a little bit more messy because they're trying to show more information 
but the blue outline here is the outline of the Dollar Lake fire. Um, all of these black hashed areas are riparian reserves, um, and this yellow area is not technically wilderness, but it's what they call inventoried roadless area, and so these areas are, if they were going to ever expand the wilderness boundary, these are the areas that they would target first because they have less disturbance than areas that have roads, um, which generally, if an area has roads, that means it has a history of logging. Um, and so it's just a higher disturbance. And so you can see the project area for this is gigantic. Um, and so we don't know exactly where they're going to be cutting, but um, they just sent out this map as part of their scoping um, comments. Um, and scoping is like the first step when they're about to propose or plan a new timber sale or any other kind of project on the forest. They have to go through a series of steps. This is the first step and then often a map is accompanied with it. And so this gives us a chance because the way that Bark, um, the way that we do what we do is by working with those series of steps and working with the laws that are in place um, to, for, you know, for the public to provide input and comments and potentially uh, sue or uh, do something else um, if we disagree. Um, so having information like this is really helpful for us to decide, well, you know, all of this roadless area and the, the area that burned is all inside the project boundary. So what does that mean? You know, if they weren't considering cutting in these areas, you know, they would have drawn the line around it. And so that would, that, those kinds of things are the, what we immediately look for um, because, you know, our highest priority is making sure that they're not making decisions that are going to affect especially um, sensitive or disturbed areas that are on forests. So. so where we are right now is on, is right here. And you can see that if you consider like drawing an imaginary north-south line through Mount Hood, um, that's basically following the line of the Cascade mountain range. And when you have large mountain ranges like that and you have, um, you know, large scale weather that's basically coming from the Pacific and moving across the U.S., um, when those weather patterns move over a mountain range, you'll end up with a, what's called a rain shadow on the far side, um, you know, on, basically on the eastern side of the mountain range. And that hap you'll see evidence of that all over the United States. So Death Valley is a perfect example. Um, Eastern Oregon is a perfect example. And so once you get onto the east side of Mount Hood, anybody that's been hiking over here, you'll probably notice that the trees are different. It's very dry. Um, and But you get this really interesting, it's not like there's just this hard line where once you get over the crest, it's immediately different. There's a transition zone. And so we are actually in one of the most interesting areas of the forest because it's in that transition zone. And so you're going to see a huge mix of trees that generally only grow in wet areas plus trees that only grow in dry areas. They're all kind of mooshed together. Um, the reason that's important is that in areas that are drier that are still forested, the fire return cycle, um, as you're saying, is can be as short as 10 to 20 years. So they're meant to burn very frequently um, because they see a lot of lightning storms, they see a lot of, um, and they see a lot of dry conditions. And so, um, and then so, this area that we're in now, this transition, is also has a slightly higher fire return cycle. Um, so you know, maybe 40 or 50 years. The last time this area burned, I think, was was well over 50 years ago. And so, part of the reason that the Forest Service let it go was because it needed to burn. It was ready, um, and so they they let it do its thing. Um, and you'll see the evidence of that in a little while, like what happened. So, um, so yeah. And if you get onto the west side where it's really wet, you know, the classic sort of dug fir, hemlock, lots of lichen and stuff hanging off the trees, and it's very moist and lush all the time, the fire return cycle is as high as 300 years. Um, and so those are extremely rare, but because you end up with a huge buildup of biomass, if anybody's ever hiked in, a, in an area of old growth or wilderness or something like that and seen huge fallen logs everywhere and there's, there's just gigantic trees, that is a really big tinderbox if you were ever to get dry, really, really dry conditions, and all of that would go up and there would be almost nothing left. Um, and that's basically what happens in those areas. Nothing is left untouched these days Powerful men with their flitting smiles and make plans After breakfast propaganda 
eating table They make plans on how to gather all their wealth It's really oh so seductive Nothing else matters no, no. I said nothing is left untouched we're going to be leaving this road really soon and going on to a more, you know, an actual trail trail that's like in the woods. There's some areas where the fire was very, very severe and there's not a single living tree left, um, which basically means that there's a bunch of uh, what they call widow makers everywhere. And so, especially since it's windy, uh, just, you know, be aware and don't touch anything. <laughs> don't lean on a tree. Uh, or uh, anything like that, so it hurts me a little bit. But um, I thought I'd stop here just because it's in the shade um, and talk a little bit more about fire's role in the landscape um, and kind of, especially you're going to see once we get onto the trail. In, 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 there's certain areas where it literally looks like a moonscape. Um, there's no. There's very, there's, well, in a lot of places, there's nothing left that's live. Um, it's a lot of really, really severely charred trees and, and very, very powdery um, ash and soil that's left over. And it looks, at first glance, like, you know, it's, very, it's, it's really bad. Um, and it, it, it's true that it is an incredibly, uh, in terms of the forest's life, I guess, or life cycle, it's an incredibly delicate time. Um, it's really prone to... Uh, or it's really susceptible to disturbances and other things, other sort of forces on it. And so it's especially important. Um, part of the reason I mention it is that there has been, especially in recent years, uh, this really popular idea with, uh, with the Forest Service to go in and do salvage logging, um, which is where they basically go into an area after a severe burn and they clean it up by taking out all of the dead trees that burnt in the fire um, because they consider them worthless, um, and they consider them, uh, I'm not even sure why, because they're not exact, they're not all that useful for timber and a lot, or lumber in a lot of cases too, but they can make sawdust out of them or plywood or whatever, so, but, um, it's, it's like the worst possible time to, to go in and cut timber because it's in this really fragile state. Um, the, the soil is really, um, is exposed and really prone to erosion and a lot of, the only, like a lot of the, what keeps it together it, right after a fire is the fact that you've got a lot of standing dead trees. You probably have some tr dead trees that have fallen over and that kind of holds everything together until it has a chance to revive itself. Um, and the other thing about that is that, I don't know if anybody noticed when we came in, um, did you, that first little lake that we came upon, did you notice the color? Yeah. Was that gray, yeah. ashy color? That's all soil and ash that's coming off of this burn area down into those streams and so there's a lot of there's this huge pulse of nutrients into waterways um, that that cut through you know burnt areas after a fire and it's actually an important it's it for areas like this that are prone to, to frequent fire it is actually a really important like part of the life cycle is a stream too it's a it's a it's a it's this huge pulse of nutrients that the stream would otherwise never see because one of the things about a, an undisturbed forest is that it's an incredibly tightly controlled environment in terms of nutrients. Um, and so there's just, there's no, there's nothing extra anywhere. There's no fertilizer, there's no, you know, there's, it's, so it's, everything is growing at, its, at a certain pace. There's a certain mix of species and, and it's all for a very particular reason because they all play a role in either in helping release nutrients or, or keep them in place. Um, and so one of the things that, that ecologists have found is that what inc there's this concept in ecology that's basically a complexity. And it basically means that if, a, if an area is more complex, it's able to support more, a more diverse set of species and basically more, it's more productive. It maybe stores, if you want to look at it in terms of storing carbon or uh, promoting more species of birds, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Um, but Regardless, it's um, complexity is goes right along with this idea of limitation, and also not only limitation but variability in that limitation. And so, if you have 
if you have really strong limits on nutrients or, or whatever it is in certain periods of time, then that changes. Like, so say a fire comes in and it, and it, it burns up the, the duff layer of the, of the, uh, the ground, basically, you know, down a few inches and releases all of that into the stream. Suddenly, all of those nutrients that were on the forest floor are now in the waterways. It's really good for the waterways in that way, but not so great for the forest, right? Because it's lost all those nutrients. And so, but in areas where the fire is really frequent, they've adapted to that very situation by um, basically there are there are native plants, herbaceous plants, and we'll see two really good examples of them that, that are called pioneer species that basically come in and they start, you know, replanting the ground after, you know, a severe burn, and they start the cycle of replenishing um, those nutrients. And you see examples of that so in fire prone areas you have that, but even in areas that aren't fire prone, say on like the west side of, of Mount Hood where fire happens once every 300 years, there are other really severe disturbances such as landslides. And so there are other species that have adapted to come in and start repairing the ground um, after a landslide. And a perfect example of that is this. This is an alder. These are nitrogen fixing plants, similar to, you know, like the whole soybean corn thing. You know, soybean fixes nitrogen and the corn it consumes a ton of it. So, nitri so alders do the same thing in a forest. They're, they're very, they grow very fast. They grow in huge clumps like this. Um, and they, sta they do two things. They stabilize slopes and they also fix nitrogen. So they play a really important role after a really severe disturbance for starting to replenish nutrients and kind of start that cycle again. Um, so, yeah. So I guess pretty soon here we're going to be turning off the road onto a trail. Um, we're going to go through for a while. It's It gets pretty steep, but just take it slow, and um, I'm going to take it slow too, and we'll get through it. And then we're going to come upon like, some really awesome views, and you'll get we'll get to a place where you can start to see that larger structure of the burn that I showed you on the map where it had the red areas and the, you know, the yellow areas, you know, the difference, the differences in severity, we'll start to see that in the landscape because we'll be able to look out on these ridges and it's really, it's really remarkable. It's called a nitrogen fixer. So basically it takes nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is inert, into very, very powerful double bond. Um, maybe it's triple bond, I can't remember. But anyway, it's not usable by, by living things, but nitrogen is a really important nutrient for all living things, um, including us. And so it just is able to take it in, similar to the way it takes in carbon dioxide, and it 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 just transforms it into a molecule that is, is then what they call bioavailable. So it's available for um, in this in this the structure of the soil and everything for other plants to use. Um, part of it it happens while it's alive in the root structure. But most importantly, alders are not very long-lived, and as soon as they get shaded out by fast-growing conifers, they die, and then they fall over, and they start to decompose, and that's when it releases most of it. So, um, so it's similar to, like, if anybody's familiar with gardening and you have, like, a cover crop of clover or something like that, and then you turn it under in the spring, um, that, and that, that's the same idea. How did the fire start? How did it start? Uh, strangely enough, it was lightning. <laughs> so, yeah, so there, I mean, this, this area is, there's a lot of thunderstorms. Again, the, the cascade, the mountains, that not only creates a rain shadow, but it also, wind hits it and it sends it, you know, shooting straight up into the atmosphere. And that's what causes, you know, it sends all the hot air that's near the surface up into the upper atmosphere and that causes thunderstorms. Um, so you get a lot of lightning strikes. You can have thousands of lightning strikes in an hour um, and they start fires constantly like little ones they might some of them might never get big, bigger than an acre but every once in a while if it hits in the right spot it'll just take off um, so this was a lightning caused fire um, there are many fires that are also caused by humans um, by shooting at rocks or spark plugs from motocross bikes mm -hmm. or you know, burning letters from <laughs> ex-lovers. I don't know. <laughs> All kinds of weird stories have come out in the last in the oh, recent years. But weekend. yeah, <laughs> actually, I think there were two in one year. It was back in like 2002, I think. There was a huge fire in Colorado. That was that was a Forest Service employee that was like a like was burning love letters. Oh, and then yeah. there was the Rodeo Chetiskai fire in Arizona. That was love letters or uh, the service he was providing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the details. But then there was one that was started literally by an ATV, like a, for a spark plug from an ATV 
it was the Rodeo Chetuskai fire, and then both those fires were just g gigantic. Um, burning at the same time caused huge health problems and all, all kinds of things. What's so. the vector for the pioneers? Uh, wind, I think. But also, some of them just, you know, they show up right after a fire, they disperse their seeds, and then they just sit, they can sometimes sit inert in the soil for years and years and years, and then they don't, they actually get, um, re they, they get uh, activated by heat. Oh, yeah. So the ponderosa pine is a classic example of that. It requires fire to actually regenerate itself. Doug, Douglas fir, strangely enough, is the same way, even though those tend to live in wetter climates. Um, the way that they seed is in very exposed mineral soil, which is exactly what you get after an inc a, a really severe burn. So the soil we're going to be walking on now, this really powdery white stuff, highly mineral. Um, so it's an interesting thing about uh, like really the wet forests over on the side. You don't see a lot of regeneration of Douglas firs. It's mostly hemlocks that are coming up. You'll see them all on the stumps and everything like that because once a, fo once a forest is established, Doug firs don't have a way to sprout. Our riches are so thin these days And they're easily lost so paranoia sets in We must have more and more specific things I wanted to point out about Dollar Lake, um, one of which is just, I think a lot of you have noticed already that if you look out on this ridge, you know, you start to see the patchwork of, of burn severity um, through the landscape and, you know, that, that can be caused by a, a, a bunch of different things. It can be the topography and so, you know, you get these ridge and valley systems and down in the valleys, if you have a really strong stream flow or stream systems, that can often create a protective buffer just in a really narrow band um, because the water's evaporating and it's actually <coughs> protecting the vegetation that's there. Um, and it starts evaporating more rapidly if there's a fire present, right? So, so that'll happen and then, um, you know, just quirks in the wind or weather can leave areas unburnt or it might, if a fire is burning super hot in one area, you know, trees might be exploding and sometimes these literal, literal like fireballs of burning material can launch into the sky you know, and then it'll land somewhere a thousand yards away, start burning that area, and everything else in between will get missed, you know, like especially if, the, if there's not a lot of wind that day. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. And so what, that, what ends up happening is you, you get these areas that end up, you know, just becoming more resilient because the trees are left and, you know, some of the undergrowth got burnt away and you're left with a lot of, if it's low intensity, you end up with more, um, uh, charcoal creation as opposed to just incineration um, and when you get charcoal I mentioned earlier to a couple people that charcoal has this amazing property it's it's largely devoid of nutrients itself but um, it has these the surface area of charcoal is, in, is incredibly intense there's a lot of what they call like there's just sites for things to bind to it and so what it ends up doing is that if it gets mixed into the soil it holds on to everything that's around it and it can end up binding and holding on to nutrients and other uh, materials in the soil and and preventing even with uh, you know water moving through the system and everything it can prevent a lot of that nutrient loss that you would see otherwise so that's low intensity and then you get these high intensity areas where it's literally the forest has just it's almost like a big red reset button on that map it's it's things have just are starting over again and so you may end up with more nutrient loss um, and you know in this area here on these steep slopes and up on this ridge everything is burnt it's probably going to come back as forest again but um, it may not um, it may there are there, there are times when a fire will permanently change a landscape it might turn it into a meadow um, sometimes you might get like massive uh, earth movement going on because all of the stuff that was holding the slopes back is suddenly gone and you might get really huge shifts in the, the physical uh, geography of the place. Um, 
And increasingly, we're actually starting to see um, another stressor that can, alt that can permanently alter landscapes. It hasn't started happening up here, but they're seeing a lot of evidence of it in the southwest, and that's effects from climate change that are permanently... So drought and, uh, and mountain pine beetle and bark beetle are actually killing off huge swaths of forest, and they're not really sure what's going to come back. Um, it's probably not going to be the trees that were there before, because the, the moisture regime the moisture regime is suddenly different, and so you might get something else. You might get more juniper, you might get oak savanna, you might get a, a permanently altered landscape, and it really gets to this philosophical philosophical question of of permanence and this, uh, the idea that we have of wilderness and sort of setting aside these places that are really amazing and beautiful, but I think at least some people sort of expect them never to change. Um, and when things like this happen, you get these really massive alterations that can really be difficult to sort of wrap your head around because it, in your lifetime it probably will it will never look the same most likely it may never look the same again <coughs> so I mean it's it's actually kind of incredible because we do have these sort of living laboratories now these wilderness areas but there's I think that especially with fire you get this I, this this natural or I don't know what it is, it's natural or whatever but it's this response in people where they want to prevent it from spreading because it's going to, you know, damage or or destroy, you know, those are a lot of the words you see when these, when, with events like these, the way they're described, and it's, yeah, it's a, it's a huge change, but it's, it's part of how these areas, uh, it's just been going on for a long, long time this way. I guess the only other thing I would say is that it's, the Forest Service for Mount Hood, or the, the, the districts on Mount Hood recently came out with an official finally an official fire management plan. Um, they hadn't had one up until now, I think partly because Mount Hood, you know, the majority of it doesn't have a lot of, of a really frequent fire return like the Rocky, like the areas in the Rocky Mountains or down in Arizona or in Mexico do. But um, whatever the reason, they they came up with a plan and it's, it's largely, um, it's largely based around suppression and this idea of just stopping any fire that starts. And it was really surprising to Bark as an organization only because, you know, we have seen evidence of sort of younger people or, or different people in the Forest Service that are starting to recognize, you know, the role that fire plays in the landscape, how important it is. And so we were expecting a more uh, robust uh, way of tackling fire, I guess. And so it's... Um, it's 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 interesting because I mean you have that so you have that that layer of management I guess but then you also have the decisions that are made by individual foresters or fire incident commanders or whatever when a fire burns and so I don't think that that ultimately will play out as badly as one might expect. What do you expect but, to happen when the rains come and all this stuff erodes and we get rivers flowing down? And yeah, I mean you will see some erosion. Um, it, a lot of that will be. It, 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 it does get mitigated somewhat by, you know, the trees that are already falling over will prevent stuff from moving. The bear grass and the lupin and the, the fireweed and all of those these other plants that are coming up are preventing that kind of stuff too. The root systems of the dead trees that are still left are actually holding a lot back as well. Um, there's a lot of momentum, or not momentum, but it's, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it's... Inertia. Inert there, thank you. There's a lot of uh, inertia there where, you know, stuff that's, that was being held in place by root systems and everything else are still being held in place. Um, but you're right, I mean, we're already seeing evidence of, of erosion um, because the streams are running white. Um, that, you know, the ones, not, not the one that we crossed over when we started, but when we were driving in, both those major streams we crossed over were this milky white, and that's because of that. Um, and again, so yeah, there is there is nutrient loss here, um, but but it's it's a nutrient gain for those streams. So it's kind of a trade-off, I guess. Well, all the news reports sure you hear on these on these fires that have been going on, they always talk about that the fires will uh, create its own weather. Yeah. Well, exactly. I kind of guess what that means. Wind, but. Well, it's I mean it's this it's basically the same processes that create weather in general. Where you get differentials in pressure and temperature and moisture and and fires just do that on a really intense in a really intense way on a really small scale and so you can get you have so much heat 
um, and so much oxygen being consumed on, at the ground that you get, you, it literally creates its own wind because it's just sucking, sucking air toward it so it can burn more. And then all of the heat is lofting, the, then loft, p punching the air into the atmosphere. Combine that with smoke, which have, you know, billions and billions of tiny little particles that, that uh, enable, uh, that moisture likes to bind to, and so you can get clouds forming. And so, yeah, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's just a really uh, fast developing weather system. Tornadoes, I've heard too. Uh, yeah, I mean that's again that's just you know the the there's so much there's so much oxygen being consumed that you can get all and then combine that with topography and everything else you can get you know weird vortices and all kinds of crazy things happening. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. the fires are really hot. Fires are very very uh, scary. Um, at least for the people that need to get close to them for one reason or another or feel like they need to.